And now it's my pleasure to introduce Ryan McInerney, CEO of Visa, to introduce our first honoree. Good evening, everyone. Let's get down to business while we're here this evening. My name is Ryan McInerney. I am the CEO of Visa. I'm honored to be here. I'm even more honored to be introducing the wonderful and amazing Mary Cranston. I've had the privilege to work with Mary for a little more than the past decade or so during my time at Visa. And during that time, I have witnessed the incredible and successful leader that she is, someone who is unique in her passion, not only to drive tremendous business impact, but equally the impact on individuals and the community around her. Let me start with the impact that Mary had on Visa. Put this in perspective for a second. Mary served on the Visa Board of Directors for 16 years, from 2007 to 2023. She was on Visa's board at our inception. We started as a public company in 2008 and went public with the largest IPO in history. That IPO, our market capitalization, was about $40 billion. When Mary retired from our board earlier this year, Visa's market capitalization was $470 billion. She served on almost every committee on our board and was chair of the Audit and Risk Committee for almost six years. Her tireless leadership was critical in helping Visa get off the ground as a public company when a lot of people didn't know what we did or how we did it. As an attorney, she was an exceptional partner who leaned in to help us think strategically and be critical about the challenges and opportunities ahead of us she has an exceptional understanding of the complexities of a global business, and she had a very, very strong voice on our board. One of the things that always stood out to me about Mary is her investment in others. She's an exceptional mentor, and especially a champion of women. And I know a lot of that was driven by her own experience coming up through the ranks as a young lawyer in a profession with too few women. When she came to Visa, she brought that spirit, that tenacity, that drive, and, that, and she had consistently been a champion of women leaders in our company from day one all the way until she left our company. Two of the women here today, Kelly Tullier, Visa's Vice Chair and Chief People and Corporate Affairs Officer, and Julie Rotenberg, our General Counsel, both benefited significantly from Mary's investment in them personally and enabling them to reach the highest levels of our organization. On a more personal note, Mary has always been a fantastic supporter of mine, and she's been a critical mentor in my career at Visa. Each of us, Kelly, Julie, and myself, are better, more equipped leaders today because of Mary. And finally, you cannot talk about Mary Cranston without addressing her impact on our community. She is a huge force in the Bay Area in terms of her support for charitable endeavors and has leaned in to a number of charities where she's made an enormous difference. Of her many involvements, the one that I've always admired and she's talked to me many times about is the American Heart Association, which I know holds a special place in Mary's heart. Mary, I can't see you out there because these lights are very bright up here. It is a privilege and an honor for all of us to be here honoring you this evening. Thank you for everything you've done for Visa. Thank you everything you've done for us. Thank you for everything you've done for the community and everybody in this room. Please welcome me in honoring Mary Cranston. <laughs> No one could have guessed how a Catholic nun's career advice would impact the trajectory of Mary Cranston's life. The nun said to my twin sister Susan, why don't you want to be a nun? And she says, I'm going to be a doctor. And the nun said, you can't be a doctor, women can't be doctors. 
My sister went on to become the first female board certified vascular surgeon in the U.S. My twin had a clear passion and was not going to let anything stop her and that has been such a motivating example to me. Mary Cranston's mother scoffed at the nun's admonitions and taught her daughters that they could do whatever they wanted to do with their careers and lives. That really woke me up out of my early conditioning to be a good girl and get A's because you have to break through that in order to really be yourself and to maximize your potential as a leader. Like Susan, Cranston heeded her mother's advice and went on to become a trailblazing powerhouse in the legal profession. And along the way, transformed an industry that had long been dominated by men. Born at Stanford, Cranston would later follow her mother's footsteps in attending the prestigious university, where she earned both her undergraduate and law degrees, and where she would remain active throughout her life. An early job at San Francisco's Pillsbury Madison Sutro, then a small but venerable law firm, helped advance Mary's worldview as she focused on antitrust litigation. As an expectant mother in a profession with often merciless hours, Cranston won Pillsbury's support for creating a pioneering maternity leave policy. It was one of many innovative workplace policies and reforms she achieved during a career at Pillsbury that spanned three decades. Throughout her career, Cranston worked tirelessly to open doors for countless women and knock down barriers that had kept women from advancing. And not just women, but people of color, LGBTQ plus lawyers and staff, and others who had been historically marginalized by discrimination and bias. She believed firmly that a workplace culture built around diversity, equity, and inclusion was not just a moral imperative, but a business necessity. And under her leadership, Pillsbury earned national accolades as a top place to work. In 1999, Cranston took another pioneering step, being named chair and CEO of Pillsbury, to become the first woman to head a major U.S. law firm. She would quickly prove her acumen, not just as a keen legal mind, but as a strategic business leader. None of this ever works unless there is a real commitment and push from the top. And you've got to have leadership that's not just giving it lip service, but truly understands the complexity of unconscious bias. By the time Cranston retired as chair and CEO in 2006, she had guided Pillsbury through two mergers, more than doubled its size, making it the nation's 20th largest law firm, and elevated it to international prominence. But Cranston's work was far from over. In the years since her retirement, Cranston has volunteered her time at her alma mater, serving as a Stanford University trustee, a key leader at Stanford Law School, and chair of Stanford Children's Health. Her unparalleled leadership skills and focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion have also made her a coveted board member for numerous private companies, including Visa, CSAA, TPG Capital, and Juniper Networks, among many others. Throughout it all, Cranston has remained fiercely committed to achieving the vision she described when the American Bar Association honored her in 2005 with its prestigious Margaret Brent Award for Lifetime Achievement. The energy and commitment that we feel to each other in this room can become commonplace. It can become our daily experience. And that's what we really want, and that's the vision that we need to set, and we have really got a picture it happening. Because the world needs us to achieve that vision. The challenges of our time, access to justice, world globalization, unprecedented environmental problems, these are going to take the highest level of leadership and lawyering skills that we have. And we cannot let discrimination or personal fear or cultural expectations stop us from doing everything we can to make this world wonderful. Please welcome Mary Cranston to the stage.
And now the managing partner of Pillsbury, Roxanne Polidarno, is going to come up and engage Mary in a short uh, conversation to kind of give a little more color to Mary's life. So Roxanne, please join us. Hello, Mary. Hello, everyone. Mary, you are a pioneer, as we all know in this room. You are a pioneering woman at Pillsbury, a major law firm. So I want you to tell us what it was like, especially as a mother, and what you did to thrive as a litigator, a partner, and ultimately become and serve as the first woman CEO and chair of a major law firm. Well, you know, let me start by acknowledging that um, my legal career that led to my position as the chair and CEO of Pillsbury was a complete team effort. And I certainly made my personal contributions to the firm, but those contributions were supported by and blended with the work of all of my other partners and everyone else involved in Pillsbury. So it's really a great honor to be here tonight with so many of my Pillsbury uh, friends and partners, and uh, I want to just thank you to start with that. Um, I was also uh, very fortunate to be in San Francisco and at Pillsbury, the, at that time the largest and certainly the oldest law firm in San Francisco. The city and firm were way ahead of the rest of the nation in how they treated women and, and provided opportunities for women, I think. And it's hard to imagine it now, but Pillsbury was literally the very first law firm in the United States to offer one of its employees a maternity leave. And that was to me, and it was for my oldest child, my daughter, who's here tonight. She's now 45, so it wasn't even that long ago. <laughs> So I was, I was very, you know, and I, I think about uh, Pillsbury also had women partners way before other law firms in the United States. Tony Remby, who many of you may know, Margaret Gill, these were superstar lawyers and so helpful to me in my career. I loved them very much. Um, and, you know, you just think of the great leaders of San Francisco, female leaders that we've produced, including, I think, the two uh, finest politicians of our era, Nancy Pelosi and Dianne Feinstein. And that's San Francisco. <laughs> So I was lucky uh, with the city, and I was lucky with the support of my firm, but I had to figure out how to become a leader in a male-dominated environment. And um, I was of that pioneer generation of women who came out of professional schools for the first time in more than a few, you know, there were more of us than one or two. And uh, we honestly thought that the hard part was getting the job offer and getting through the door at places like Pillsbury. Uh, but it turned out that that was just the beginning. And we, we all, as a generation, had to come to deeply understand unconscious stereotypes, what it meant, and how to succeed in that environment. And um, I think uh, what I'd like to talk about tonight is a, a two insights that I had in that journey of understanding bias, which uh, I mention it because I think even today, for women and underrepresented minorities building a career, Understanding these things is really critical. So I became a student of the emerging research on the reality and the implications of unconscious bias. And I learned about the unconscious presumption in our culture that men are natural leaders and that women are more likely to be team players and not leaders. Uh, that turns out not to be true, but it uh, certainly has impacted many women's careers where they had to overprove their leadership ability. And uh, both men and women carry these biases. Uh, it plays out differently in our minds, though. In women, it's self-doubt. I don't think I can be a leader. I'm not worthy to be a leader. In men, it's often an inability to truly appreciate the potential of a woman to be a leader. So, uh, and I think the most important thing I learned was that these stereotypes are unconscious. They're not malicious. And that they can be ameliorated considerably by dialogue, respect, and, and conversation. That was the first realization. The second thing was I set goals for myself that were outside of what women were generally expected to be able to do. Um, I did know what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a top trial lawyer, and I wanted to be a big rainmaker. I kind of look back at that now and think, what was I thinking? But that was definitely what I wanted to do. And literally, no woman in the US had done that. So, um, but the interesting thing about that, as soon as I set those goals, my mind told me I couldn't do that. 
No one's going to give you the opportunity to do it. You're not going to have the chance. Why do you think you have the skills to do that? You know, blah, 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 blah. And I frankly had to learn not to listen to these thoughts, not to believe them. And it's simple to say, but it, it's a hard practice to really, really spend the time to get onto your deepest fears and to just not believe it if it's going to stop you. And I did become a lawyer, a trial lawyer, and a, and a rainmaker. But understanding the dynamics of bias in myself and others and freeing myself from self-doubt was such a gift. It enabled me to see opportunity more realistically, to evaluate talent more clearly. And when the firm came to me and asked me to be the chair and uh, CEO of Pillsbury, I had the fortitude to say yes, even though no woman had done this job. And, and it did bring, bring up self-doubt again. But of course, I knew how to deal with self-doubt. I just ignored it. And <laughs> with my beloved teammate, um, Marina Park, who was the managing partner of the firm, which in corporate parlance means the COO. Uh, we grew the firm organically and through the two largest law firm mergers as of that date. Uh, we innovated a client service model that is now used pretty universally in law firms around the world. Uh, we increased our margins and profitability and tripled the number of women and underrepresented uh, minorities in leadership. It was a profound honor to and pleasure to lead Pillsbury with Marina. She's here tonight. Thank you, Marina. And I am deeply touched that Pillsbury is a major sponsor tonight. So that's kind of my story. Thank you, Mary. Um, a lot of your points resonated with me and I'm sure many others in the room. Uh, I think we've got about four or five minutes left and I'd really like to get your perspectives on San Francisco, an issue probably on the tops of minds of many people here. You're a third generation San Franciscan and began your 50-year career at Pillsbury, San Francisco's oldest law firm. Um, you've served as a long-standing director on many of the Bay Area Company's most important uh, boards, including Visa, AAA Insurance, uh, TPG, Juniper Networks, and Stanford. Uh, while you were at Pillsbury, you also served for many years on the Bay Area Council and the Committee on Jobs, which is now Advanced SF. So I would really like to hear about your perspective about San Francisco's business prospects for the next 20 years. Okay, first principle, never bet against San Francisco. <laughs> you know, Pillsbury has been San Francisco's leading law firm for 150 years, as you mentioned, and for 50 of those years I was on the journey. And I made it my business to study Pillsbury's history. And it's actually a really fascinating lens into the transformations in San Francisco and the Bay Area and all of the changes that the city has undergone as it's generated itself for the next generation. And let me just pick a few examples. In the 1870s and 80s, Pillsbury incorporated the antecedents of Chevron and Pacific Telephone and Telegraph, and that was part of the investment in California that drove our ability to become a worldwide leader and economic force. After the great earthquake and fire in 1906, Pillsbury brought the lawsuit that sued the insurers to prove that it was the fire and not the earthquake that caused the damage, thereby getting the funds to rebuild the city. In 1945, as the post-war era started to uh, usher in global, the more global economy, uh, Pillsbury's John Sutro chaired the committee and the, the uh, global event, event and conference in San Francisco, very similar to the APEC conference, that was the foundation of the United Nations. And in 1968, Pillsbury incorporated Intel, which is the semiconductor pioneer that started the Silicon Valley. And then in 1980, we were involved in the Genentech IPO, which was the beginning of the biotech evolution. And today, Pillsbury is very involved in AI in our community. And guess what? San Francisco is the incubator of that new and really unprecedented technology change. So San Francisco has reset itself many times. Um, and it will do it again. Just think of our natural assets great ballet and opera, uh, some of the finest investment firms in the world. Um, we have uh, world-class universities, great entrepreneurs, and we have drop-dead beauty. I mean, what can go wrong? And um, 
as, I, as you said, I am, um, I, I'm actually personally very excited about San Francisco's next chapter. I, as, I am, as you said, a third generation San Franciscan. I raised my children in the city and my fifth generation grandsons, Jackson and Grant Hamilton, are here tonight. You can stand up and wave to everybody right there in their Christmas sweaters. That's the next generation who's going to be running this place, and I'm definitely betting on San Francisco. And to me, it's such a great honor to get this award tonight with Hamid, who I know has been a real force for this, this latest reinvention of San Francisco. And we are both incredible boosters of San Francisco. Thank you so much, Mary. And um, we're being called off the stage, so I thank you so much for your insights. We could go all night long. I know that for sure. But thank you. It was a great honor. Thank you, sweetie. Mary, Roxanne, thanks very much.